Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our K-Scope 22 speaker series. To give you a little background, the idea behind the speaker series titled Masterclass with your K-Scope 22 guru is to bring you diverse subject matter experts, dedicated innovators, and industry champions who are transforming the Oracle Cloud ecosystem. If our mission is to help businesses run better, one of the best ways we can do that is by bringing everyone together to share new ideas, start meaningful conversations on a variety of Oracle Cloud EPM topics, and hopefully inspire you to join one of the most talked about events in the industry, ODTA K-Scope 22. Today, our next speaker has influenced many senior executives, CEOs, peers, and has over 29 years of experience in accounting operations, consolidations, and financial reporting. He has implemented over 10 cloud-based consolidation transformations and architected over 50 cloud-based consolidation implementations, challenging his clients and implementation teams to always expire beyond, well, it's what we've always done. Without further ado, Please welcome Argano Interrail Senior Director of Consolidations, Terrence Walker. To be honest, it's far too kind. I was almost wondering, who is she speaking of? <laughs> it's just you and I, so it had to be me. So thank you so very much for those kind words. I really appreciate it. Let's go ahead and hop into today's session. So you are known <laughs> to be the fashion icon. So let's go ahead and dive into that. Uh, just so you know, we're gonna spend the next few minutes just getting to know you before diving into today's session. Okay. To our audience, the Q&A box is open for you to submit any questions you may have for today's speaker. This can be a fun question, maybe about fashion, or any pondering question relating to financial flows. So let's get into the fashion. Okay. Most know that when it comes to any a meeting, no matter the, occasion. You're not the one to ask about the time or the location, but more so, what's the dress code? <laughs> so given that, who is your favorite fashion role model? Everything you said was almost true, then some. <laughs> but if you ask me, who do I feel would have been a fashion icon in my life? Not to get sappy, but it would be my father. Uh, one of the things that we always discussed as a child was never being unaddressed for anything. Mm -hmm. And as a child, I didn't always understand. Mm -hmm. But as I grew older, it became my comfort zone. Uh, if I felt good, it was in many cases because I dressed, I felt comfortable with my dress. So from that perspective, I tend to, at times, overdo it. But it's like my blanket. It's my comfort zone. So that's the reason why I am as incented to be I'm thoughtful about fashion, but I'm more point to be effective from a delivery perspective. I love that. And I see the bow tie. I love the nice suit jacket. So we all know <laughs> that you're the fashion person. Um, I absolutely, I love it. I'm into fashion and I definitely agree with what you had said that for me personally, if I dress well, if I feel like I look well, I am going to do well. It doesn't matter if I'm at work. It doesn't matter if I'm at the gym or even going to the grocery store. Like it's, exactly. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. So kind of turning directions a little, uh, what was the best vacation you have ever took and why? This one's interesting because it actually has a K-scope tie. Okay. Back in, I would probably say 1996, 97, uh, when I worked in industry, and there was a time when I wasn't working for Argonaut Intro, but back when I worked in industry, I was actually attending Hyperion Solutions, which preceded the Casco conferences. Mm. I had a brilliant idea that I would invite a young lady to the conference with me, and I would propose to her. Now, again, not knowing how this would play out, it actually worked out very well because the conference was at the Venetian and I was staying across at the Mirage and we just happened to be just walking around, doing some sightseeing prior to her leaving and it happened. Gondolas, gondoliers, perfect. So the romantic that I'm probably not, that moment put me in a perfect space. So long story really short, 
it was a long line and she was going to leave to head back to Dallas in I think three hours. And there was no way we could get to the front of the line and to go through and get her back to the airport on time. Well, I just told her wait there. Uh, I walk up to the front and the young lady that was manning the entrance, uh, I simply told her that I uh, have a situation. I want to propose. And she probably heard that before, but I showed her the ring. Then she believed me that as I showed her the ring, she got excited. I was like, whoa, calm down. The more excited you are, the more she'll know something's going on. So truth be told, she calmed down and she said, all you have to do is bring her here and I'll get you guys on next. Well, she brought us on. I proposed. She accepted. And from that point, she's been my best girlfriend since then. So that's our case scope time. And it just happens to be one of my favorite vacations in ever. So I have to ask, does she like the event? Does she like what was going on? Or was she kind of like in this whirlwind of, oh my God, I am, I was just proposed to. <laughs> Well, fortunate for her, I would probably, probably say fortunate for her, she didn't actually attend the conference. She was just there for the weekend prior to. Mm. And it was almost whirlwind for her, Brianna, because after I proposed, we, we literally left the, gond the gondola and hurried back to the hotel, grabbed her bags, hopped on a tram, got to the airport, and she made it back home safely. Again, not necessarily how I thought it would play out, but I think it worked out fairly well. Oh, my gosh. That's I love that. <laughs> I will have more questions later. <laughs> so are you into any podcasts or do you listen to any music that you would like to share just to give the people a little bit more idea of, you know, what you're into? I am a huge music fan, um, but in being so during the COVID season, music delivery was a bit different than probably prior to COVID. And that I was able to befriend a few artists and said artists actually had podcasts. So I found myself actually partaking in their podcast. And it was more or less an opportunity to have an intimate opportunity to connect with the artists, what have you. And again, this person I'm speaking of is Eric Robeson. He is an R&B soul artist. He is a great songwriter. Uh, and that's actually been one of my new passions since COVID is listening to podcasts learning, gleaning things from other or different perspectives and seeing how that might impact my life. So yes, musical leanings, absolutely. But it's gently transitioning to participating in podcasts also. So it's crazy that you say that because I always say since I've always been a music lover, um, grew up with music, it literally alternates like my mood, uh, which is statistically proven that it will, it can make you happy, it can make you sad, et cetera. But since COVID, podcasts, have been my thing. And I would say crazy enough. Yes, of course, tech podcasts, but I've become kind of a true crime junkie. Like, I don't know if it's just because of COVID or what's going on, but uh, anything has to do with like just old documentaries, true crimes, et cetera. It has for some reason fascinated me, which is weird because I am the scariest person alive. <laughs> but if you can eat one food, for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? And I think hard about this. This is where you're probably going to judge me because that's a tough one. I don't mind being judged. <laughs> there are three things in this world that I simply adore other than scotch. Popcorn is one. French fries is a second. And third is sushi. You would never believe it, but I'm a huge sushi fanatic. So if you ask me to attach my horse and buggy to one of those three, ooh, this hurts. It's probably gonna be French fries, Brianna, because that's my thing, that's my jam. I love popcorn, I love sushi, but I can probably make this thing work on French fries and French fries alone. Between French fries and poutine and different forms of French fry potato, I could probably make it work. You know, that's very, very true. I, I don't think I've ever heard French fries before, but you can. You could do like a cheese fry, chili cheese fries. You can have them plain. You can have salt, ranch. I'm not going to say ketchup because I am definitely a ranch person. Okay. But I, I agree with that. And all three choices are great, very common, especially popcorn. Um, I've heard popcorn a lot, so which is, P.S., one of my favorite snacks. But yes. we're not mm -hmm. here to talk about me. We're here to talk about you. Sure. So, if you are stranded on a deserted island, it can only take three things with you. What would they be? Oh, no electronics. 
Okay, so bye bye cell phone. Okay, um, <laughs> bye bye cell phone. <laughs> the first thing would have to be a Bible. The second thing would probably be a picture of my family. Oh God, that's difficult. And the third thing, thing because I'm a sports fan, this makes no sense. And there's no alignment. It would probably be a football because On I'm a huge, island. <laughs> I'm a huge sports fanatic, and I can make fun by myself. That's no issue for me because remember. I'm a 75 and sunny degree guy. So no matter what, it's always going to be a good time, Brianna. So you know, if you give me those three things, I could find a way to have a good time. <laughs> and you kind of not quite answer my question, but I'm like, who is it going to play? Who's going to play catch with with the football? I guess just uh, toss it in the air. A there you go. Yes. Maybe elevation, kind of maybe measuring that in your head, how high you can throw it up. Like I, I could see how that things. could be a good time. I could definitely see that. Yes. So in the summer, would you rather go to the beach or would you rather go camping? If you said cabining, I'd say cabining, <laughs> but you said camping because camping. cabining no in my mind, well, cabining is four bedrooms, three baths, palatial kitchen, a little deck, maybe even a pool, but camping is outdoors. So definitely not camping. So given the options, I think it's probably obvious which one would probably be preferable for me, the beach. Yeah, and I guess there's more like fashion choices that you can choose from, from the beach, considering, you know, camping. <laughs> like where are you going? <laughs> See, I'm right there with you. Like where are you going? So, um, what first interested you in the topic of financial consolidations and close? Now, that's interesting because in my background, I'm an accountant at Nature and I tend okay. to always have to offer that disclaimer when I'm having customer interfacing opportunities because people tend to believe that I'm a IT person or technical person, but truthfully, I'm much more functional. Um, I have a leaning towards the technical opportunity, but I'm truly much more of a functional person. So that said, given my background, my background, as you mentioned, is fairly lengthy. And from an accounting operations perspective, that has a direct tie-in to financial consolidations and close, and also have a background in financial reporting as well. So simply that specific union of accounting and financial reporting simply lend to my desire and my interest in the financial close space, if nothing else, and more importantly, being able to evangelize and speak to the merits uh, of the opportunities that we have from an Oracle EPM perspective to deliver successful uh, options or opportunities for our clients. You know, and that makes perfect sense. Just like you said, it was kind of in alignment with you being an accountant, which was a fun fact. I did not know that. So it's pretty interesting. I love that. So in your experience, what motivates you um, to just do your best on the job performance wise? You're known to just always go above and beyond. So what kind of just gives you that extra motivation, um, no matter what's going on, no matter what projects, what requests come in to really uh, just put your best foot forward. As a born again workaholic and it's very typical life, difficult, difficult life. <laughs> um, the one things that I, the one thing I probably that I've always been uh, maybe even charged myself from my perspective is to always do my best and to show well. Uh, that said, I'm awfully oftentimes very difficult on myself. I'm probably my own worst critic. That said, and being my own worst critic, I'm always thinking of different and better ways to do things. I'm also charging and challenging my team to do the exact same thing. So from that perspective, I just think that the internal person who I am, the human that is, who wants to be more, who wants to do more, who insists on being more than just average has a component, but the sacred part of me also exudes that level of expertism or that excellence as well, by not simply want to be just that, just a average person. Wow. So it's it's almost more than just wanting to be better and do better. It's almost insisting on it and accepting nothing less. Wow. Yeah, great answer. Um, wow. So what is one important skill that you think that everyone should have? I love answering that, or questioning this question, uh, well, asking the question because I get so many different responses. What important skill do you think that everyone should have, no matter what? I think that the most important skill that anyone should have, no matter the discipline, no matter the space, is listening and effectively hearing. 
it's very difficult in our space to simply deliver without hearing what desires and our expectations are. So from that perspective, I, I'm a big champion for making certain that everyone's voice is heard. And in doing so, it also includes it almost creates a level of inclusion, Brianna, because if I'm heard and you're actively entertaining my words, my thoughts, I'm much more likely to be part of the conversation, the solution, rather than a bystander. So in my mind, having the ability to effectively listen and to effectively incent people to offer their commentary is very important or the more important skill set from my perspective. I love that answer. And like you said, listening, I mean, you can go so far with just hanging tight and hearing the other person, you know, versus just ready to respond or show a report or show analytics, just kind of listening to the other person and hearing what they want, what they need can definitely go a long way. So kind of circling back to K-Scope, um, how many K-Scope conferences have you been to? This is where you're going to make me think, and I wish you asked me this question. <laughs> so let's think. So I already mentioned that I attended multiple Hyperion Solutions conferences prior to it transitioning to K-Scope. So that would probably be from 93, 94 to 97, 98. Oh, God, it's a lot. Then transition to consulting. Count. I do want to say that because we had a few questions last time of digital, digital conferences count. So I definitely include that. So if digital conferences account between Hyperion Solutions and Kaleidoscope, which became K-Scope, I would probably say anywhere between, oh God, Jesus, 15 to maybe 17, 18, including digital conferences and even the interrail Hyperion Solutions conference as well. Yeah. So anywhere between 15 and 17, if my memory, which is failing me these days, isn't failing me at the moment. That is many, many conferences, especially K-Scope conferences. Um, I can only aspire to go to that many. So what is your favorite part of K-Scope? Um, I'm going to just go ahead and throw that out there outside of, you know, kind of peeping the fashion choices. What is your favorite part about K-Scope? <laughs> I, I think that, well, my wife would probably differ because she probably thinks me packing for K-Scope is probably my favorite part of it, but it isn't. It's not. I, I think that the most enjoyable part of the conference isn't necessarily speaking or listening to other presenters, but I tend to get the most excitement from the Sunday Symposium. And in the Sunday Symposium, the Oracle EPM Pro development team speaks to uh, new features, functionality of applications. They offer roadmap directional definitions or, or conversation for the actual different business processes. So in my mind, if you ask me the one area of excitement for me, it's probably the Sunday Symposium, not necessarily waking up for them, but just simply participating and listening in on those conversations. Great answer. So at this time, uh, we would love to see a sampling or <laughs> teaser of what you'd be presenting at K-Scope. Um, and then to the audience, mm -hmm. while he goes ahead and uploads that, I would love to launch a poll to see which Oracle community events that you are planning to attend. Um, just take a few seconds to let us know if you're going to be going to Blueprint, Ascend, uh, K-Scope, Cloud World, and then uh, we'll hop into the last portion of today's segment. And we'll leave this up for a few seconds and then end the poll and I'll be sure to share the results. Uh, Terrence, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Brianna. I pray that you can see my screen now. Uh, again, I I'm very excited. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you can, okay. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to speak uh, three different times at the K-Scope 22 conference uh, that's upcoming. Before I speak to that though, First, a bit about Argonne Interim, not to get overly salesy, uh, but I've been with the company for quite some time and our direction hasn't changed. We are a relationship building company who are incented to be collaborative and to work with our clients, which actually is a direct correlation to our mission statement, which is simply to leave the world a smarter place than we found it. And that is a credo that we simply live by, or live to every day. 
A bit of additional information or content relative to Organo NRL. We're very, very excited to have been the five-time EPM and Analytics Partner of the Year. We've received a number of commendations over our years, or at least my tenure with the company. Um, but the one that I'm probably most excited about is a very, very recent addition. Within our consolidations practice, Brianna, 100%, 100% of the resources in our practice are certified. They don't specialize, but they're certified as Oracle FCC implementers. Mm -hmm. Very exciting times for the practice, even more exciting times for our company. Really great, really great um, commendation to have reached that actual, um, that attainment. Uh, as far as being fully certified. So we're real excited about that. And I can't wait to share more with the public on that. Now, when it relates to the company as, itself, when we speak to who we are, who we are might also be indicative of our net promoter score. Now, theoretically, when we think of a net promoter score, for those who aren't aware what that is, it actually speaks to how you're regarded by your customer community. Do they appreciate what you've done how you've done it and what you've done for them, and more, and more importantly, are you a reputable company that they will vouch for as it relates to future work and or speaking to other potential clients to speak to the merits of who you are. Now, that said, Organo Rendero has a 77% R, uh, NPR score, which again, on a comparative basis, but other systems integrators isn't even within reason because at 77, the average for global systems integrators is simply nine. But then for systems integrators, 24. So there's a tr tremendous delta between who we are and who we compete against. Something that we're really, really excited about. And if we can hold true, we hope to see that score increase as we constantly incentive to continue to be improving as a company. Now, next, uh, based on what you asked for, Brianna, I'll speak to what I'll be delivering at the KSCO conference. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm very blessed and fortunate all at the same time to have three sessions that I'll be presenting at the conference. The first, I'll be speaking to customer success with FCCS. I'll then transition to speaking to customized calculations that anyone can build. Remember, I mentioned that I am a functional guy. Now, I go back as far as microcontrol to hyper enterprise, to financial management, and to financial consolidation and close. So I've seen the evolution of the EPM suite from on-prem to the cloud. So I've seen that evolution. I can speak to it fairly well because of my life. But we want to make certain that for those who have that inclination to develop, to build calculations that we speak to and offer some avid, candid examples uh, that might hopefully incent people to consider developing better, developing more calculations. And then I'll wrap up where I'll speak to the advent of uh, one of the more phantasmal application feature definitions that Oracle's offered to basically take performance where we've never seen it before from an EPM cloud-based solution, that being the advent of the then sparse optimization. I'll speak to that uh, in great depth and detail. But also want to make certain that you guys are aware um, that Edward Roski, our CEO, will be leading a vendor session. So we want to make sure that everyone who has the capacity and that's attending K-Scope does attend that session because, again, we'll have raffle winners or an opportunities for those folks who do desire to attend Edward's session uh, to, one, impart on his wisdom and also receive, a hopefully receive, um, a gift as a byproduct of being the winner of said raffle. Now, a bit more content or specifics regarding the actual sessions that I'll be speaking to. The first one, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be much more a directive conversation that speaks to how our clients can be successful in their implementation pathway. Now, the reality is there are a number of things that go into that path to success. And this, con this actual session will speak to how we lead our clients from a little ideation perspective how we challenge and we charge our clients to be more than what they currently are. We'll also ask very pointed questions where we're simply trying to make certain that our clients understand what these types of implementations may mean to them. In doing so, 
We're going to be incented to make certain that they're prepared for business process improvement, which may incent change as well. And as a byproduct of that conversation, there is probably going to be some form of disagreement. But as I'm notating, disagreement in some fashion to be harmonic. We don't always have to agree, but we can leave the table in union from a thought perspective rather than simply insisting that things be my way. And then lastly, when we talk about ideation, how we make ideation live, we try to make certain that everyone who has a seat at the table has a voice. That say we also make certain that as you're going down a path of delivery, we want to make certain that the leadership team is driving the change for what we're implementing and not just our voice. It shouldn't be the implementation partner speaking to what the importance of that change shall be, but the actual leadership driving that change and having an operational team see that to fruition. We'll also make certain that we'll talk through how from a leading practice perspective, those certain points of conversation as far as what should, what we shouldn't consider uh, from a little implementation perspective to make certain that as we're going through and defining that project life cycle, we're defining what they may look like from a design perspective for the differing uh, implementation phases that we're going through as part of our ideation phase. Another part of the conversation that we we're speaking to customer success will be where we speak to user acceptance testing and how important that adoption is from a user community perspective. We'll, we'll actually speak to and give some options uh, for going in and defining the corresponding teams, leveling expectation, speaking to what the actual end goal is, but more importantly, making certain that that UAT group is trained and more than prepared to move forward in that UAT endeavor. We'll also speak to the advent of change management. Now, change management may mean differing things to different people. In this session, we'll give some more pointed analysis between the differences between change management and project management. And we'll speak to the benefit of how a well-implemented change management methodology can incent or improve adoption of a newly implemented uh, solution. And we'll also, as we're talking through these individual concepts, so again, it's very difficult to for me to be brief, but I try my best. We'll also speak to some pointed um, customer success stories, um, where they were and where they took them in their EPM journey. Um, we'll get some candid feedback, some candid content that speaks to uh, the good, bad, and in some cases, the ugly in that transition and how weathering those storms made their lives easier and in many cases better from the implementation's perspective. Now in my second session, as I mentioned, I'll be partnering with one of the most amazing people in this world, Madam Veronica Tafoya. Many of you know her as Veronica, or Ronnie, excuse me. I know her as Veronica. In this session, we're going to actually peel the layers back on calculations. We're gonna give some pointed examples as far as how calculations can be developed. And more importantly, how you should be thinking as you're going through developing new calculations and you're thinking through how to more effectively and efficiently develop these types of calculation content in your applications. And again, we'll talk through differing examples. We we'll talk through different premises for actually developing these actual calculations. First, I guess we'll say memo formula is better yet. Then we'll transition from a memo formula perspective to speaking to how there are many, many options that we have from a little calculation perspective to more dynamically draft or craft calculations. In this example, we'll speak to the advent of leveraging, user defined attributes for making calculations a bit more dynamic by simply assigning user properties to more actively or avidly loop through members rather than having a more static calculation that simply calls those members out. So again, we'll talk through some different options that we have from a member formula development perspective and how to make those member formulas work uh, without fail. We'll then transition to speaking to insertion point rules. And again, for many who have an S-based background, insertion point rules are more or less calculation scripts. We'll speak to the differing content uh, options that we have as far as how we craft them. We'll speak to the differing 
uh, syntactical definitions will speak to how we can make more concise calculations, leveraging cross-dimensional operators, what have you, to make those calculations more focused. Uh, so this is probably going to be the more entertaining portion of the, of the session. We're going to be really, really get deep and talk through design considerations of calculations and why calcs work as they do. We then transition to some opportunities, we'll say, uh, because many of our, our, our users or our cohorts tend to craft calculations in a specific fashion because it's their comfort zone, they've done it before. We'll speak to some functions that are available to us that can also, in the spirit of dynamic, uh, make those calculations a bit more dynamic and most importantly, more efficient from a delivery perspective. And then last, the last session that I spoke to earlier that I'll be delivering will be the advent of the dense sparse optimization, which is a groundbreaking improvement as it relates to application performance. That said, in this session, Brianna, I'll speak to the actual option to be able to migrate a pre-existing application from standard edition to the sparse optimization uh, and walk through the actual wizard definitions and pretty much paint the picture for outcomes. Uh, maybe set the standard for expectation uh, as they're going through in that migration, or even from a net new application perspective, the benefits of developing an application or creating an application, better yet, that is leveraging the dense sparse optimization or DSO, as we tend to use in our space ground because we love acronyms. So I'll just say DSO to keep it clean. Now, in that effort, we'll also speak to some housekeeping opportunities that I'll speak to. We're talking about that, that moment where we're transitioning or migrating our pre-existing application to do SDSO. We'll speak to how that application changes from a little dimensional perspective, as well as um, the corresponding underlying functions or properties that are also part of that transition as well that coincide with that performance improvement that comes with DSO. We'll also speak in great depth and detail to some literal application transitions or transformations that we perform as a byproduct of implementing the DSO opt uh, optimization. Um, and from that perspective, we'll speak to application sizing improvements. We'll speak to little performance improvements and consolidations. Again, these are all very, very important questions that every client asks. How fast is it going to be? Is it going to be too large where it's not going to be literally op uh, operable to have you? We'll speak to these uh, in much more candid detail in this session as well. Now, that said, that is a literal uh, encapsulation ground of the three sessions that I'll be speaking to at Case Scope 2022. But before I go any further, I must first thank you all for attending the prior three masterclass sessions led by Edward Roski. Lynn Schwartzberg, and Mr. Kevin Whalen. I'll thank you guys in advance for attending the upcoming sessions led by Josie Monsano Stetler and Mr. Wayne Van Sluis. Here's the more is a depiction of our full listing of sessions that the Argano Intro Lights will be delivering, or excuse me, Argonauts, I guess, will be delivering at our Case Scope 22 conference. And again, for any of you desiring to make certain that you are, can attend as you have done today, please make it a point to come introduce yourselves because we'd love to meet you and maybe establish a relationship uh, at the Case Scope 22 conference. And then lastly, for any of you who've yet to register for Case Scope 22, and shame on you, please use the Argonaut NRO registration code to receive a $100 discount on your, on your registration. With that, Brianna, I think I probably talked too much, but forgive me for going overboard, but I did want to make it a point to uh, give some level of a teaser, as we tend to say, as far as what we'll discuss and cover in the case scope sessions. So with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Terrence, for meeting with us today, giving us the opportunity to get to know you, and of course, giving a teaser of all three of your Case Scope 22 presentations. Um, I also just dropped that link in the chat box for you all that would include uh, the Case Scope 22 speaker series, as well as our Argonaut internal savings code. If you would like to view past speakers or even registers for next week's webcast, please visit epm.bi forward slash kscope 22 gurus here you will see uh, next week's presentation same time same day 
masterclass with your K-Scope 22 guru, ask Josie Mazzano Stetler about enterprise planning. Thank you again, Terrence, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much as well. Be good, Brianna. Bye-bye. Yeah.